we've got some concerns for you if you're a cannabis patient or wanting to be a cannabis patient. Uh, last show we talked about Kamala Harris and her proposals for us, new rules, which are going, not going to work for us. I, don't, I have to tell you now, they're not. those rules will not work. Um, she is giving law enforcement discretion of whether someone deserves cannabis, regardless of the doctor's letter. With what happened to the doctor-patient confidentiality here. And the patient can only belong to one dispensary, which will send us, uh, we patients, back out to the streets. And Kamala was fighting gangs by busting everyone when she was getting trying to get elected here uh, in the Tenderloin. I have videos of it. I covered it. And Channel 4 covered it as well about the increased enforcements pre-election, of course. And... Uh, and now it seems like she, now that she's in office, she's being told what to do by cops because we used to deal with her on a better level than this, so we're hurt by this. And um, the cops are telling her how to regulate cannabis in our state. So. Um, the ACLU says the Department of Justice in memo impedes access of medical marijuana patients to vital medicine. And it's a... Uh, this is actually a press release. The American Civil Liberties Union today said a federal drug enforcement mandate outlined a Department of Justice memo threatening with federal prosecution people who grow, sell, distribute marijuana under auspices of state medical marijuana laws could deny patients who suffer from serious medical conditions access to vital medicine. The memo issued by Deputy U.S. Attorney Jan uh, General James M. Cole claims it reiterates a 2009 DOJ memo issued by then Deputy Attorney General David Ogden stating that a federal drug enforcement resources should not focus on people whose actions are clear and amb unambiguous compliance with existing state laws, laws providing for the medic use of medical marijuana. But Cole's memo today makes clear that the only people who, for whom federal prosecution will be deprioritized are patients and that everyone else involved in a rational and carefully calibrated system of state regulations is vulnerable to federal prosecution. Cole's memo comes several weeks after the ACLU sent a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder asking that he make clear DOJ will not prioritize the prosecution of people who comply with state medical marijuana laws in keeping with previous DOJ policy. The ACLU sent its letter after several U.S. attorneys across the country sent letters threatening to prosecute people in compliance with state medical marijuana laws, including state employees and state licensed providers of medical marijuana. Sixteen states in the District of Columbia have enacted state medical marijuana laws. Today's D DOJ memo leaves these states with un an untenable choice to uphold the will of the voters and enact reasonable distribution schemes or bow to federal pressure and deny patients their medicine. The following can be attributed to Jay Rorty of the ACLU Criminal Law Reform Project. Quote, and this is a quote, patients who suffer from serious illnesses need safe and reliable access to their medicine without the fear of federal prosecution for them or their suppliers. The most tangible outcome of today's memo will be that very sick people may be stripped of any legal avenue through which to access their vital medicine and needlessly and unconscionably left to suffer. States that have enacted medical marijuana statutes appear to be more concerned with public health than the federal government because states are taking every step to ensure that patients receive appropriate palliative care through regulated systems of distribution, whereas the federal government appears willing to allow patients to die in pain without appropriate pain relief. Now I have a friend who was in the VA hospital who died. It seemed like they were trying to kill him off. Uh, and they stole a thousand dollars from him while he was dying. They stole all his money. And 
denied him use, using medical cannabis because it was the VA facility, so, and that was all that would help him. So, uh, if they're saying this alternative, these hospitals are going to help more than the cannabis community, think again. The cannabis community keeps us alive longer than these hospitals are, and doctors quite often. Or they were, if the doctors are willing to work with us, that, that is the ideal circumstance. So, um, since we might be pushed out into the streets, you might want to know what to do during a law enforcement counter encounter the legal preparedness information here. Um, do not consent to a search. Tell them you're going to remain silent and you want to speak with your attorney. These words may not prevent you from being arrested, but they do protect key constitutional rights that are very important in court. Never plead your case to the police, no matter what they say or threaten. That's important. Remember this, police do not have the authority to prosecute you or sentence you. However, they can and will lie to you during investigation or interrogation to get you to give up your rights. 96% of all criminal convictions come from what you say in the first five minutes of a law enforcement encounter. Remain calm, keep your hands where they can be seen, never touch or in any way prevent the police from conducting their business. This can be considered an, an assault. If you're a cannabis patient, you should always have a plan for getting out of jail. Have a phone tree with all your friends, just in case, to notify P um, all your friends in case you, uh, if you are arrested. And make, a f make friends with a criminal lawyer. It's a good idea. Look them up in the phone book. They often will specify that they take cannabis cases. It's usually a criminal lawyer you want. So, uh, yeah, memorize your physician's and lawyer's phone numbers, keep them in your phone, and have them written on, down with your recommendations so that you can access them during a, your, while you're being detained. Tell all your friends that you're a medical cannabis patient so that they know, they, they know what to do if you do have an emergency with the police. And uh, just keep, make sure that your cannabis has, for, med for per personal medicinal use only, sticker on it. That helps a lot. Now, when you say, don't, I don't consent to a search, say it loud enough to have people witness that, if you can. Uh, because witnesses are sometimes vital to your being exonerated of the charges. Um, they can pat you down for the weapons. If you're arrested, they can search you uh, to the skin. They can get somebody of your own sex to search you quite intimately. Do not ever in any way prevent or appear to be preventing an officer from conducting whatever he's conducting because you will lose. Never touch an officer, their car, or equipment. See, now the second point we'll go into a little more is I'm going to remain silent. I want to speak with my lawyer. Police will say anything to get you to incriminate yourself, so never answer any questions. You're not legally bound to answer any of their questions. That's for your lawyer to answer for you. And all convictions, almost all the convictions come from information that you gave to the police in the first five minutes. Like we said before, don't talk no matter what not even a friendly conversation like nice weather we're having. Uh, it's your constitutional rights. Exercise them. Please tell Kamala Harris that you disagree with her current proposed guidelines for our community. They were written by and for the cops, not for our community at all. It has none of our best interests in mind, so it's just for cops. and. Our community actually keeps the cops, it keeps the cops from having to do more work because we get a lot of people off of hard drugs. So please remember that when you make your restrictive guidelines. These guidelines are way, way, way too restrictive and it's going to send us back out in the streets to buy our cannabis. So that'll mean more money for, I don't know, gang cops? <laughs> now the Patient Advocacy Committee at City Hall the subcommittee of the Medical Cannabis Task Force 
The Patient Advocacy Committee gets a lot of work done. We are, it's practically the only committee where only the patients show up. The people with money are on the committee, but they don't show up, so that's how we get a lot of work done. So, anyway, here's our, a list of our concerns and our proposed solutions. One of the concerns that poor patients have is um, medical cannabis patients who use or possess their medicine at home can be at a risk of losing their federally subsidized housing or veterans benefits. Huge concern. The solution would require a change in federal law. So There's a bill going through Congress right now. We'll see where it goes. I think Barney Frank submitted it. Veterans Administration and HUD Housing have both come out with statements regarding medical cannabis use, but we have not seen a change in federal law. Until we see federal change, it would, it would be ideal to have city-funded housing available where tenants are only required to follow state law. And here's another concern. Medical cannabis patients have been evicted from shelters for use or odor of cannabis. And by shelters, I'm talking about homeless shelters. Uh, here and there about the city. They're scattered around. There's one on 3rd Street. There's used to be one on Polk and Geary. I don't know if it's still there. but uh, San Francisco, uh, The solution is that San, let them recognize that San Francisco is a sanctuary city for medical cannabis patients and shelter staff should be knowledgeable on state and local law. Shelter employees should not put a person's safety at risk over the medicine recommended by their physician. No one should. It's Physician, patient, sacred. San Francisco Shelter Monitoring Task Force should hold shelter off shelter staff accountable if there is a violation of the client's rights. So that's a concern. Another concern is only a few medical cannabis dispensaries have compassion programs now. I can testify to that. I came to America in 2005 after living in somewhere else in another country for a while. I come back because I heard Gavin Newsom say we were going to make an example out of San Francisco and be the best cannabis uh, city in the whole country. So I'm sure he won a lot, a lot of votes by saying that. So I heard about that. It was a pot shot heard around the world. So I came straight home. and. It wasn't like that, so. But it's not perfect, but it's better than a lot of places, so I'm not complaining much. Not about our local, although Santa Barbara has better laws. But back to this um, compassion program. Each dispensary should create a unique pas compassion program supporting the San Francisco non-binding resolution regarding compassionate care, passed in February of 2006, I believe, by Ross Mercurimi, uh, Supervisor Su Ross Mercurimi. Uh, there's a lot of people that oppose that. They think that they shouldn't be bound to give anything away. Uh, okay. Hmm. I spent a lot of money in those dispensaries, thousands of dollars, and I was eating in the glide line around the corner here three times a day. And there's when you're in the glide line, that's six hours a day, and there's time, little time for other things. You have like three hours to do other things before you're just absolutely exhausted. So it's strenuous to have no money, no medicine, and no food. You buy, you, I mean, what little money you have, you buy what little medicine you can afford at the beginning of the month, and the rest of the month you're on your own. So uh, patients on different income levels can contribute with a copay that fits their budget. That's one solution. San Healthy San Francisco, which is a, our insurance plan, should include medical cannabis. Now there's going to be a lot of screaming about that. Now here's another concern. I mean the last concern was the last two, the first and third concern were very, very important life and death type concerns. Uh, Current N MCD definitions of 10 or more patients may include low income cultivation and patient centers. These type of facilities cannot afford to come up with the permitting fees, nor should they be required to go through the same process as storefront facilities because they don't have any money. We spend our, I spend money, my own money, sometimes to buy a cake for someone's birthday or for an anniversary, but I spend my own social security money 
and a lot of us do. So we're poor people helping poor people. We're not asking for anybody's money in that case unless they want to contribute. We're not asking the patients for any money. So no money changes hands. The solution for that would be to change the definition of MCDs and allow for other types of medical cannabis facilities which are uh, A, compassionate care facilities like Actus of Love, and there, might, there may be others, but I think we're the biggest one. And B, a self-consumptive garden. Here's another concern. Many low-income patients have living conditions which do not allow them to cultivate. For example, they have roommates that object, or they have Section 8 housing, which is federal, nor do they have the resources to cultivate in communal gardening projects. The solution for that would be municipal medicine should be implemented and supported through voter approved Proposition S. So, youth housing for HIV positive patients does not allow for use or storage of cannabis and that's a concern. The solution state allows medical cannabis patients to use and possess cannabis. This should apply to one's residents as well. Here's another concern to iron out. Most low-income patients can't afford to pay for a doctor's visit and state ID card for their medical cannabis so they don't get arrested, let alone their medicine. I know mine costs $120 a year to renew mine and I have to save the money, save up the money for that and go without other things, so I can feel that. And the solution for a doctor's recommendation, encourage San Francisco Department of Public Health to allow any qualified physician a, of a San Francisco Public Health Clinic to write medical cannabis recommendations. For example, the Tom Waddell Clinic, and there's a South of Market Clinic also, they should be able to write them. And Glide. Glide. Well, that's a church, so that's different. <laughs> and uh, for affordable medicine, implement Prop S, the self consumptive garden model, also. So here's another concern the medicine donated to low income patients is often of low quality. The patients in most need because they can't work and get disability payments, which are very small are not getting the high quality cannabis that works best for them. The solution for that would be San Francisco Collective should follow San Francisco's 2006 non-binding re resolution for no and low income cannabis patients. Defining compassion as high quality of medical cannabis no donated to low and no income patients on a consistent basis. That's the solution. If you know of anyone that does that already, please let me know. Email me. Email me about anything, any of your concerns. Another concern, patients need the correct strain for their particular needs. Can't overstress that. Some strains are useless for other pa some patients and which will really help another patient. So, Keith works for glaucoma, sativa for depression, indica for pain and sleep, and topicals for topical relief. And the note to the cultivators of cannabis, please keep the strains pure. There's a lot, you know, too much mixing of the strains, it doesn't necessarily make it better medicine. Sometimes quite the opposite. The solution, the collectives need to check in with their patients and cater to their specific health concerns. whether it's going to be indo, sativa, concentrates, edibles, tinctures, a range of patients compassion accordingly. And another con concern is patients' letters are being misused. Some of these dispensaries will take a recommendation without growing anything for you, even though that rec recommendation entitles them to grow 24 plants for you. So if you're not around to get your, re I've given my letter to a lot of people before I knew better. So if you're not around to check on what they're doing, they could grow a lot of a lot of cannabis and use it for whatever they want to use it for, and under your name, it's not fair. So patients should have the right to know how many plants are being cultivated on their behalf 
and how much medicine will be given to them at harvest. And there should be a little check mark at the bottom where of your form that states it's an option for identification purposes only. Not I do not want any plants cultivated on my behalf. And there, therein is the truth. Each MCD should host an annual membership meeting where each collective member gets an equal vote in the collective policies. It should be clear from the membership agreement, rules of the collective, when the annual membership meeting takes place, who the community liaison is, and what services are provided to members. Each MCD should have a suggestion and grievance process. So that's another concern. That mandatory transparency in your membership agreement it should be clear what is expected from the collected and collective and from the patient and so the last meeting of the patient advocacy committee took place on the uh, 13th and they voted in favor of the following statements at the meeting page one was patients may join as many collectives or cooperatives as needed to fulfill their medical needs or share their surplus within the legal limitations and two, every member of any collective or cooperative has the right of a membership vote. Three, every collective should have a suggestion process as well as a grievance process. And number four, every member has the right not to have plants grown in their name and to request that the re recommendation be used for verification purposes only. So no one does anything dodgy with your letter. And uh, I thank you for tuning in this week. We hope you tune in next week at 10 p.m. and check the BAVAC, BAVC.org website for the times that Axis of Love shows. Thank <laughs> you.